In this week's Weekly Story Jokes, we bring you our best story compilation of the week. These story jokes are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes which we love to generate. This week we bring you five story jokes, starting with a story about baby boom until we end with a story joke about a mother-in-law's mayhem. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach ache. In our first joke of the day, we bring you a 70 years old man with a young bride who still want a lot of children. Love after 60? Absolutely. At least that's what David, a man with a story to tell, and maybe a pacemaker, and his stunning wife Tiffany believe. In today's cartoon story joke, their whirlwind romance took a delightful turn just a year in, and let's just say David was feeling like he could conquer anything. But can this playful confidence in his own engine keep up with the demands of a growing family? Buckle up for a hilarious look at a marriage that proves age ain't nothing but a number, with a few cheeky mechanical metaphors thrown in for good measure. A 70-year-old whirlwind named David, with a pacemaker that hummed a suspiciously jaunty tune, married the stunning Tiffany, a woman young enough to be his granddaughter, but with much better taste in men, obviously. Their whirlwind romance culminated a year later in the delivery room, where David was bouncing around like a toddler hopped up on pixie sticks. He looked like he could have bench-pressed the entire medical staff. Let's just say, fatherhood was probably less of a marathon and more of a victory lap for David at that point. A few pushes later, and a healthy, 3.5 kilos baby boy arrived, the picture of perfect health. The exhausted but ecstatic nurse approached David, ready to offer some congratulatory words. So, Mr. Johnson, is this little bundle of joy yours? Oh, you bet he is. And yep, this engine of mine is still working. I mean, look at him. Two years zipped by faster than David on a new scooter with a nitro boost. Doctors strongly advised against it. But hey, the man craved a little speed. Now sporting a permanent cane that coordinated surprisingly well with his collection of novelty socks, think flamingos and spaceships, David found himself back in the familiar territory of the maternity ward, alongside the ever-radiant Tiffany. Another healthy 3.5 kiloliter bundle of joy, this time a beautiful baby girl arrived, letting out a lung-powered scream that could have rivaled a Harley Davidson revving its engine. The familiar nurse, Abby, with a knowing smile that could curdle milk, glanced at David, her eyebrows raised higher than a surprised disco dancer. Another winner of yours, Mr. Johnson? Oh, yes, ma'am. This engine of mine is still working and purring like a kitten. Two more years sped by like a greased pig at a county fair. David still had a scar from that unfortunate incident, bless his heart. Now sporting a hearing aid that whistled feedback whenever a particularly enthusiastic toddler shrieked and a cane that doubled as a handy back scratcher, David found himself back in the increasingly familiar delivery room. This time, however, the room wasn't filled with the sterile scent of newborns and nervous anticipation. No, this time it was a full-on toddler tornado, a rambunctious 3.5-year-old ball of energy with eyes that mirrored Tiffany's and a mischievous grin that could only belong to David. Because, let's face it, the kid had somehow figured out how to operate the vending machine in the waiting room, a feat that even David, in his younger days, wouldn't have dared to attempt. The familiar nurse, Abby, with a look that could melt steel and possibly diagnose a broken toe from across the room, glanced at David, a single eyebrow raised higher than a confused showgirl. Is this one yours, Mr. Johnson? But this nurse was clearly worried about Mr. Johnson's stamina. But you know he is now a 75-year-old man, so his engine is purring more smoke than anything else. So she pushed her thought aside, especially when she saw David beaming with pride. Sure is. This old engine's still running strong. The nurse, bless her ever-observant heart, was practically a fixture in the maternity ward at this point. She could identify a first-time dad from a seasoned pro just by the sweat on their brow. Or, in David's case, 
the suspicious gleam of worry hiding behind his new bifocals. This time, however, her gaze lingered a beat too long on David. Maybe it was the fact that his cane seemed to be doing double duty as a walker now, or perhaps it was the hearing aid whistling a jaunty tune that clashed spectacularly with the beeping of the nearby heart monitor. Whatever it was, Nurse Abby puffed out her chest, a woman on a mission. This wasn't just about offering congratulations anymore. This was an intervention. Well, Mr. Johnson, you may want to change that oil of yours. This one burnt more fuel and came out black. <laughs> In our second joke of the day, we bring you a husband that is sure that his wife is having an affair. In today's cartoon story joke, buckle up for a high-rise homicide. A jealous husband gets the shock of his life, leading to a chain reaction of chaos that will leave you hanging, literally. But fear not, there's a laugh, or two, or ten, to be found in this story that takes a hilarious nosedive from suspicion to the pearly gates. There was a businessman, let's call him Harold, who was sure that his wife, Beatrice, was cheating on him, so he put her under surveillance. One day at work, he got a call that told him to rush home quickly and he would be able to catch her in the act. So, he rushed home to his 20th floor high-rise apartment and burst into the room. His wife was there, but he didn't see anyone else. Where is he, huh? Where is who? Harold, fueled by a jealous rage that would make a bull see red, tore through the apartment like a hurricane searching for a misplaced sock. First, he flung open the bedroom door, expecting to find a scene straight out of a romance novel. Instead, he was greeted by the serene sight of his wife curled up on the chaise longue, reading a book about the mating habits of the Patagonian Mara disappointment clawed at him, but his suspicion remained undeterred. He lunged towards the bed, yanking the covers back with enough force to launch a dust bunny into orbit. Nothing. Next, he dropped to his knees and peered under the bed, squinting into the shadowy abyss. All he found was a rogue sock and a colony of dust mites having a rave. Frustration bubbled over turning his face a shade of purple that would make Barney the dinosaur jealous. Where are you hiding him, Beatrice? In the closet with your skeletons? He flung open every closet door with a flourish, expecting to find a secret room or a hidden passage. Instead, he was met with a disorganized collection of clothes, mismatched shoes, and a moth infestation that would make a fashion designer weep. Just as Harold was about to admit defeat, a faint sound reached his ears. It was a muffled whimper, like a cornered rodent, coming from the balcony. With renewed vigor, Harold stormed out onto the balcony, ready to confront his wife's supposed paramour. But the sight that greeted him wasn't what he expected. There, dangling precariously from the railing, his fingers desperately gripping the metal, was a man in a bright orange jazzer-sized leotard. Harold's jaw dropped faster than a mime impersonating a skydiver. Uh, what in the world are you doing? Help! I was just doing my jazzercise routine and, well, I kind of lost my balance. Harold blinked, processing this bizarre turn of events. Here he was, expecting to catch his wife cheating. And instead, he found a man clinging to his balcony for dear life, dressed like a creamsicle gone wrong. His initial rage morphed into a kind of bewildered amusement. Right, because Jazzercise is known for its balcony balancing exercises. Are you sure you're not here for something else, like delivering surprise flowers to my wife? Dude, I wouldn't even know your wife if she walked past me wearing a neon sign that said free hugs. Just please help me up. So Harold decided that is time to learn this man a lesson. So he went to go and get a hammer. He then began hitting the man's fingers and watched triumphantly as the man fell 20 stories. But to his dismay, the man fell into a bush. Although badly injured, he wasn't dead. The businessman was livid. He went into his kitchen and rolled his refrigerator out to the balcony. 
He heaved it over the edge and watched with glee as the refrigerator landed on the injured man, killing him. The businessman started to laugh, but mid-laugh grabbed his chest and died from a massive heart attack. The businessman found himself in line before the pearly gates. St. Peter was there, and it was clear that there was a delay. St. Peter said, I'm sorry, but heaven is full today. We're only letting in folks who have died in a very stressful way. Well, I died today, full of stress. Really, do tell. So, the businessman related the above story. St. Peter was swayed. Really, do tell. The next guy in line stepped up. St. Peter told him the same thing. Did you die in a stressful way? Did I? And how? I was doing my jazzercise tape in my living room on the 21st floor of my high-rise apartment when I kind of lost track of where I was. I accidentally fell off my balcony and was plummeting to my sure death, when miraculously, I was able to grab onto the balcony below mine. I was hanging on but just barely when a man came out. Thank God I thought, I'm saved. But to my horror, he started stomping on my fingers. It hurt terribly, but I was able to hang on. Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, he stopped and went back inside. Thank God, I thought. But just then, he comes back out with a hammer and starts to hammer my fingers. Well, I had to let go, and I fell into a bush. Although badly injured, I was still alive, and I was just about to yell for help when I looked up just in time to see a refrigerator heading right for me. And the next thing I know, I'm here. St. Peter's mouth was hanging open. All he could do was gesture the man inside and whisper, Go on, in. After a few moments to collect himself, St. Peter said, Next. The next guy steps up and after being told the condition for entry, St. Peter asks, Did you die stressfully? Yes, I did. And here's my story. I was hiding in this refrigerator from a very mad husband and... <laughs> In this third story joke of the day, we bring you a very beautiful blonde that have a plan with the police officers. Buckle up, folks, for a laugh that's faster than a speeding sports car and a blonde that's blonder than a bottle of bleat. In today's cartoon story joke, we've got an Officer O'Malley on a routine patrol who pulled over, wait for it, a gorgeous blonde with a lead foot and a memory like a faulty flip phone. Let's see how this traffic stop goes sideways, faster than a runaway shopping cart. Officer O'Malley, a man whose dating life resembled a tumbleweed in a ghost town, was having a day that could only be described as interesting. He was writing a particularly scathing parking ticket for a pigeon, don't ask, when a cherry red Ferrari screeched past him like a runaway shopping cart full of kittens. O'Malley, heart doing a tap dance in his chest, whipped a U-turn and pulled over the culprit. As he approached the car, his eyes did a double take. Behind the wheel sat a vision, a blonde with hair that would make a highlighter jealous and eyes the color of the Caribbean on a good day. This wasn't your average traffic stop. This was O'Malley facing his kryptonite. Beauty and well, the distinct possibility this woman might not know the difference between a gas pedal and a brake. I've pulled you over for speeding, ma'am. Can I see your driver's license? Sorry, officer, but what is a driver's license? Officer O'Malley thought to himself, how can a pretty woman be so clueless? I mean, not knowing what a driver's license is. You know the small card, looking like a credit card? It has a photo of you on it and is usually found in your wallet. Officer O'Malley, a man whose patience wore thinner than a disco shirt in the 80s, was starting to tap his foot. The blonde rummaged through her purse like a squirrel searching for the last acorn of autumn, finally unearthing a plastic rectangle that vaguely resembled a driver's license. Here you go. No, ma'am, may I please see your registration? Um, registration? What's that? It's usually in you glove compartment. Officer O'Malley, whose patience had already reached the single-ply stage, was starting to suspect this interaction would be filed under 
learning experiences that make you question your career choice. The blonde, after what seemed like an archaeological dig through her purse, finally produced a crumpled piece of paper. Is this it? She chirped, holding it up with the triumphant air of someone who'd discovered a hidden continent made entirely of chocolate. O'Malley, fearing the document might be a grocery list or a crayon drawing of a unicorn, braced himself for the next round of bewilderment. I'll be back in a minute. The officer walked back to his car and called in to a dispatcher to run a check on the woman driver's license and registration. After a pregnant pause, the dispatcher came back. Um, is this woman driving a red sports car and a drop-dead gorgeous blonde? Um, yes, how did you know? Well, officer, this woman is known for speeding, and when she is pulled over, she somehow managed to get away without any warning or fine. Oh, I see. I wonder how that happens. No one knows, officer, but here is something you can do. Give her her stuff back and drop your pants just like that in front of her. Well, I can't do that. It's inappropriate. The officer was shocked. I mean, he can't do that. Trust me, just do it. The dispatcher on the other end, well, let's just say his name was Dennis, and his idea of a good time involved embarrassing others and questionable dating app profiles. He pictured Officer McHottie fumbling with his pants like a confused penguin trying to put on a tuxedo. A glint lit up Dennis's eyes, a glint that could only mean one thing, Operation Hilarious. Traffic stop was a go. The officer returned to the blonde and gave her her license and registration back, and with a big breath in, he dropped his pants. The officer just stood there, pants down and all, and looked at the blonde. The blonde just looked down and said, Oh no, not another breathalyzer. <laughs> In our fourth joke of the day, we bring you a culture clash. This Chinese man has the introduction to the USA. Ever wonder how different America is from, say, China? Well, buckle up, folks, because in today's cartoon story joke, we're taking a hilarious trip across the Pacific with a very confused Chinese tourist. Hold on to your chopsticks and buckle up your cowboy boots, folks. We're about to dive into a hilarious clash of cultures, a comical yin and yang of two great nations. It'll be like a fortune cookie with a side of apple pie or a kung fu panda doing the macarena. Get ready to chuckle your way through this international showdown. Picture Uncle Sam's grumpy old uncle, Phil, in the USA. Perched on the flagpole like a feathered judge, he squints at the tourists below. Tourists? More like crumb droppers, he mutters, glaring at a rogue pigeon making off with his breakfast bagel. Bald is beautiful, but it don't fill the belly. While in China, across the Pacific, Ping the Panda flops back in his bamboo forest armchair leaves sticking out of his mouth like overgrown broccoli. Ugh, another day, another ton of bamboo, he groans dramatically to his pal Lee. Lee, my dude, is there, like, anything else to eat in this country? Lee, another panda with a permanent case of the munchies, just shrugs and stuffs another stalk in his mouth. Nope, just bamboo. Glorious, glorious bamboo. Now in the USA, they drink coffee to stay awake if we need to work long hours. In China, just an afternoon nap will be good enough. Yes, it's coffee jitters versus afternoon zzz. In the USA, Marvin the mailman resembled a hummingbird hopped up on Red Bull. By 9 a.m., his third cup of coffee had him jittery enough to juggle mail sacks blindfolded. Gotta deliver the mail before I see squirrels, he shrieked his voice two octaves higher than usual. Meanwhile, in China, May the office worker announced, power nap commencing with the authority of a queen. Her colleagues, veterans of the siesta wars, simply nodded and dimmed the lights. As May began a symphony of gentle snores, a co-worker tiptoed in and tucked a fluffy panda plushie under her chin. Shh, he whispered, don't wake the productivity panda. In the USA, a businessman named Brad, with a handshake so firm it could crack walnuts, approached his Chinese counterpart. 
Brad Smith, a pleasure to do business, he boomed. While in China, Mr. Lee, a man whose handshake resembled a gentle wave, blinked in surprise. Greetings, Mr. Smith, but have you considered breakfast? A man cannot negotiate on an empty stomach, you know. Brad, confused, stammered. Uh, bagel? And some worries about the future of mankind? Mr. Lee's eyes widened. The future of mankind? Sounds heavy. Perhaps some dim sum will lighten your spirits. In the land of hot dogs and home runs, Larry the baseball player resembled a sleepwalker in cleats. Huh? What inning is it? He mumbled as the umpire yelled, strike three. Across the Pacific, in the land of dumplings and lightning reflexes, Wei the ping pong player was a blur of ferocious grunts and backhand smashes. His victory dance involved more flips than a celebratory pancake and enough noise to wake the Great Wall of China. In the USA, Brenda the Ice Queen chugged a gallon of ice water like she was auditioning for a polar bear documentary. Brain freeze for peak performance, she declared, sending confused shivers down the spines of nearby sun bathers. Meanwhile in China, Mr. Wang cradled his thermos of steaming hot water like a precious dragon egg. Ah, he sighed. Cures what ails you, except maybe the chills from watching American baseball players move that slow. In the USA, our family purr is a dog, but in China, a fish is more the norm. Imagine Chester the Chihuahua strutted down the sidewalk in a sequined dog sweater, shivering dramatically. This leash is a disgrace to canine fashion, he declared, glaring at his owner. Meanwhile, Mr. Chen proudly showed off his prize-winning goldfish in a tank adorned with miniature castles and plastic mermaids. Isn't he magnificent? He beamed, the envy of the entire neighborhood. Now that we've explored these cultural quirks like tourists peeking into a piñata full of surprises, let's dive into a joke that perfectly captures the hilarious clash. Get ready to snort out your bubble tea or choke on your donut, because here it comes. Meet Wei. First time in the land of the free and the home of... Well, Wei wasn't quite sure yet. He hailed a cab, ready to explore, and bam, first culture clash. Whoa, those buses are noisy and so slow. Back home, they're zipping around like bullet trains. Tony, the taxi driver, a man who'd seen enough tourists to fill the Statue of Liberty with selfie sticks, just shrugged. This new guy, Wei, was practically a walking comparison app. Those pigeons? Practically trained ninjas compared to the ones back home. So, when Wei spotted a couple of lumbering Navy ships in the distance, Tony braced himself. Sure enough, Wei leaned forward, eyes wide. Wow, those boats are slow. Back in China, our noodles move faster. Tony choked back a laugh picturing a blur of ramen racing across the Pacific. This tourist was a gold mine. Seriously? Even the boats here are slow. China's got speed demons on the water. Wei, a tourist with the narration skills of a broken karaoke machine, finally reached his hotel. One look at the taxi meter and his jaw hit the floor faster than a dropped dumpling. The close-up on the meter revealed a price tag more suited to a spaceship ride. Narrator, dry as a fortune cookie with a bad review. Looks like Wei's gonna need some serious noodle negotiation skills for this one. You got to be kidding me. Those buses are snails. The boats are sloth mobiles. So how come your meter runs faster than a Beijing bullet train? Tony leans back in his seat, finally cracks a smile. My friend, it's made in China. In this last story joke of the day, we bring you a story about divorce and a mother-in-law. All right, all right, hold on to your dentures, folks. In today's cartoon story joke, we're about to unleash a barrage of mother-in-law jokes that would make even the Sphinx groan. But hold your horses, or should I say, rocking chairs. Before we unleash this comedic avalanche, let's take a teeny tiny detour through history. 
It'll be quicker than your mother-in-law can guilt trip you into baking a pie, I promise. Let's start with the first oops, I married twice divorce. Back in the 1640s, divorce was about as common as finding a comfortable pair of jeans. You pretty much had to have a spouse with two heads, or maybe two wives like our guy in this story, to get a judge to break things off. This particular fellow, let's call him Henry, because that was a popular name back then, and because it sounds kind of stuffy, accidentally ended up married to two different women at the same time. Talk about a scheduling conflict. Let's just say his social calendar was a mess. Then there is the rise of the six-week vacation, divorce fast forward a few centuries, and people were itching to get out of unhappy marriages faster than a mime at a noisy party. Enter Reno, Nevada. Back then, Reno wasn't the glitzy Vegas we know today. It was more like a sleepy desert town with tumbleweeds and tumbleweeds of boredom. But then someone had a genius idea. Hey, why not make it super easy to get a divorce here? Thus began the era of the divorce ranch. These weren't your typical dude ranches with horses and lassos. These were all-inclusive resorts for folks who wanted to ditch their spouse faster than a bad toupee in a windstorm. You could relax by the pool, listen to lectures on the art of not so grieving your ex, and find yourself a new beau, or boo, as they probably called it back then, all within six short weeks. It was like a singles vacation, but with more lawyers and way fewer flamingos. Then there is the no fault here, except maybe my taste in partners. Divorce. Finally, in the groovy 1960s, things got a little less dramatic. Divorce laws loosened up and people could finally split because they just weren't feeling the love anymore, not because someone forgot to take out the trash. Although, let's be honest, that's a pretty good reason too. This led to a boom in divorces but also a sigh of relief from folks who were stuck in marriages about as exciting as watching paint dry. Next, there is the DIY divorce because lawyers cost more than my wedding ring era. And then came the internet. Now you could download divorce forms faster than you could say irreconcilable differences. No more fancy lawyers with their big fees. People could become their own divorce DJs, spinning the tunes of freedom at a fraction of the cost. So. That's the history of divorce in a nutshell, or maybe a pistachio shell because that's a funny image. It's a story of changing times, loosening laws, and the ever-present human desire to find happiness, even if it means saying I don't, twice, or more. All right, all right, enough with the sad trombone sound effects. We all know Liam's love life is a dumpster fire right now, but who needs a downer on a Friday night? Let's skip the pity party and fast forward to the good stuff, the laugh a minute portion of the evening. Buckle up folks, because the joke and the reason for Liam's misery all boils down to one legendary figure, Mildred, Brenda's mother. It was a Friday night and the air crackled with the sweet scent of freedom. Or maybe that was just Liam's overflowing ashtray. Our man Liam looked like he'd been tangoed with by a particularly aggressive cactus. He slumped into his favorite armchair with a sigh that could deflate a blimp, narrowly missing a half-eaten bag of Funyuns. Across from him sat Rick, his best free and since they were both convinced they could fly by jumping off the roof with bedsheets. Spoiler alert, they couldn't. Rick, ever the optimist, raced at an eyebrow. Rough day, mate? Still dealing with the whole Brenda situation? Dealing? Rick, this isn't dealing with a flat tire. This is a full-on marital meltdown, a Category 5 hurricane of emotions. Spill the beans, Liam. Did Brenda find your hidden stash of vintage Star Wars action figures again? You know how possessive she gets about Chewbacca. Far worse, Rick. Far worse. It's her mother, Mildred. Ah, Mildred. The woman who could make Mother Teresa question her faith in humanity. Brenda's a lovely lass, but her mom... Well, let's just say Attila the Hun had better table manners. You don't understand, Rick. The woman could turn sunshine into a guilt trip faster than you can say passive-aggressive casserole. Every visit was an emotional obstacle course. Liam, she'd coo, 
those jeans seem a tad snug around the midsection. Or, Brenda darling, have you considered a color palette that doesn't clash with your complexion? Sounds rough, buddy. But hold on, why blame Mildred for the divorce? Liam leans in, eyes gleaming like a mischievous chipmunk who just discovered a forgotten bag of Funyuns. Now listen here, Rick. When a relationship goes south, don't just blame the wife. It takes two to tango, you see? Blame her mom as well. <laughs> if you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here.